The Cocktail Art Challenge is here to showcase the art of making cocktails and the art of showmanship on stage, combining it into one to bring you an entire complete show. Are you ready? Cerniels, Cocktail Network Live, and I also have the luxury of representing Finest Call and Real uh, Gourmet Syrups and, of course, uh, Premium Juices for all of your cocktail needs. So, we are here today at the Cocktail Art Challenge, which is a flair bartending-based cocktail competition. So, the flair bartending is judged as well as the, uh, as the cocktail. A little different from before as we progress into the future making fabulous cocktails with flair uh, we're asking all the bartenders to be as creative as they can and we have tasted these cocktails in the past by these competitors each one of them could be on a magazine on a menu somewhere they're all beautiful cocktails very very well made and easy to sell and easy to recreate so we do that and then the bartenders add their own flair as well the bottle flip and shaker spin and glass toss in style whatever it is that they're gonna do on stage to entertain us and make us want to buy those drinks. Hi, I'm Diana Green. I'm the Eastern Regional Director for Gonzales Bias USA, representing Fundador Brandy, uh, the original Brandy de Jerez, here at the Cocktail Art Challenge 2023 at the Beer Garden in Boca Raton. Uh, tonight I get to the pleasure of judging the actual cocktails. So when I'm judging a cocktail competition like this, I know one, it's super challenging to put out a beautiful mixology cocktail uh, that's inspired, but while actually doing flair. So I think it's always challenging, but I really think that it's possible. Really what we're looking so, for is, um, this is cocktail art. So we want a cocktail that comes out in a beautiful presentation with a great garnish. Um, but most importantly, it has to be balanced. There has to be the right amount of citrus and sugar and alcohol in order to have a cocktail that's very enjoyable. Hi, my name is Angel, and I'm here representing the oldest and the biggest bodega, the Brandy de Jerez in the world, which is Bodega Fundador, founded in 1730. And the brand itself was founded, okay, in 1874. We are talking about a brand with a huge legacy and heritage. And I have to say I'm quite happy here for those bartenders playing and using and incorporating as an ingredient such a famous brandy brand. Hello, I'm Emily Tappel. I'm the marketing director for Yacht Life Vodka. Yacht Life Vodka is actually a Florida-based, American-made vodka made with only two ingredients, wheat and water. It is a proof that simplicity is a keystone of luxury, and we call this liquid luxury. It is a vodka that's 16 times distilled and then filtered. So it's an extremely pure, sophisticated vodka that has a little kick at the end, because as we like to say, what's the point of having a yacht if you're not ready to show off a little bit, right? Now we're so excited to be sponsoring today for the Cocktail Art Challenge. We know our bottle's very unique. It's square, it's slim, and a lot of the competitors are used to working with round bottles. So we can't wait to see some of the tricks they pull out with our bottle today and to see some of the cocktails they come up with with our vodka. Hi, my name is Jules Aaron. I am a uh, five-time author, spirits writer, and the USBG Nationals Health and Wellness. I'm looking for like the artistic flair, of course, keeping things balanced on the cocktail side, um, and just 
you know, have a great time. Hi, I'm Zach Doy, South Florida brand ambassador for Tequila Patron. I'm here today to represent our super premium spirit, handmade, small batches without any use of additives. I'm super excited to support our community and see what they can do artistically with our super premium spirit. This is a spirit literally from the people, for the people, that was literally brought to the world to showcase what tequila can really do. No additives, handmade, made in small batches. Tequila Patron coming to support all of you. Let's go. Hi, I'm John Cow. I'll be on the panel judging the mixology portion of the competition. Uh, tonight, what we're looking for is not only uh, proficiency uh, with the, uh, the flair bartenders, but also that they can compose a balanced cocktail that's creative, imaginative, and also uh, drinkable and replicatable. Um, more importantly, the things I'm going to be looking for is whether they honor the ingredients that are uh, being featured in uh, primarily the sponsored uh, spirits. Hi, good afternoon, my friends. My name is Manuel Picon. I'm from originally from Puerto Rico. I've been living in Miami for 10 years now. I got the pleasure to be invited uh, today to be one of the technical judges for the flair aspect of the competition. This competition and overall every day behind the bar is very important, the quality of the cocktail. That's why the name of the, this competition is Cocktail Art Challenge. It's 50-50, your flair technique is very important, but also very important day to day and here in the competition is your cocktail, the presentation, the aroma, the garnish. Hello guys, my name is Raul Guzman, or well known as Raul Bartender in social media. I've been living in Miami for over six years and originally from Venezuela. I'll be judging Flair and I'm looking for creativity. Difficulty, of course, but it's more original moves and this is very hard to do it because Flair industry is, has already like a solid base. So I'm looking for that effect of wow and originality that is very hard to find. And with that, partnering up with some great sponsors like Yacht Life Vodka, Plantation Rum, Patron Tequila, Funador Brandy, Finest Call, and Reality Infused Exotics with BarProducts.com, Rip Print, Cocktail Network Live. Pretty much all the who's who in the area are here to shine and showcase the spirit and the fun of bartending again. I'm Josh Kennedy. I'm from Seattle via Palm Beach Gardens, West Palm. Here winning this first place amateur division and this amazing competition that Rob put together. I love all the events that he does. I love just being here with the environment. I love the people. I love the art. I love making better bartenders now. I love just the whole, the whole environment, the whole the whole look, uh, I'm over here looking at all these bartenders down there just mingling and talking about the great competition we had tonight. My name is Joseph Chavarria, vengo desde Nicaragua, Managua, y gracias a Dios me dio la oportunidad de quedar en el primer lugar en el Art Cocktail Challenge Boca Ratón 2023. Gracias a Rob, a Dave y a toda la organización por la oportunidad de estar aquí este día. My name is Ivan Yusuf and uh, I'm so excited to be here. Today I was tour and uh, it's so cool because one year ago I also won this competition. I like about this competition because it's not only a player, it's also mixology. And uh, all bartenders, they have to make good drinks and player bartenders, it's also bartenders. Player is a tool, so that's why you have to make good drink and if you can make, entertain your guests, if you can make some tricks, even better. Hi, my name is Greta Bisolato. I'm the Vice President for the Palm Beach Chapter of the United States Bartenders Guild. I'm super excited to be here for this event and I'm very happy to be behind the scenes. I hope you'll join us for the next one for all sorts of educational opportunities with our, our group, so thank you. The Cocktail Art Challenge was created to be able to showcase bartenders making quality cocktails while entertaining on stage. Yes, it can be done at the same time. And these bartenders travel from across the globe just to show you how it's done. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think
think the idea of your show is amazing. You put in all the work when people aren't watching. Hey, thank you. I'm honored. Thank you for being so cool. And that's it. Have fun. So let's get into it. <laughs> we are back, brother. I can't hear you. Your, your mic's on mute, I think. So I'm going to keep talking. Yep. 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 One second. So Dean and I, we like to put our mics on mute as the pre-show because we talk and we razz each other beforehand. So uh, <laughs> there he is. Crazy. <laughs> Why? Give it to me the secrets away of the show. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking down I'm like, oh no, classic uh, coronavirus blundle or bun problem. Yes, <laughs> blender. Ah. So season five, episode six, we are halfway through the season, brother. How you doing? I am, I am very good. Excited to be here tonight. Uh, looking forward to another great show and uh, yes. Just going, 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 going. Uh, I've had lots of uh, great guests. I think I had about a hundred people through the uh, through the bar last week, uh, doing doing presentations for Finest Call Real and uh, and just sharing the word. It's been amazing. How about you? How was your last week? Uh, eventful. Uh, I don't know what sleep is. <laughs> Tuesday we had our USBG Palm Beach meeting. Uh, a right. great meeting with uh, uh, Salento Organic Tequila Nomad Outlawed Whiskey Outland Whiskey. Uh, but more important, Diana Green, which you remember, who judges a lot of our yeah, competition. Yeah, in the radio, this opening video. Yeah, there you go. Um, can't silence the Serenos. <laughs> that was the thing. I can't silence the Serenos. <laughs> he was there teaching a, a seminar about uh, financing for bartenders. Like, we're bartenders. Oh, wow. We have disposable income. We don't know how to do our finances. Uh, totally. Not only did she give us a lot of pointers in directing us, but also took it a step further. Um about like now you want to create your own company llc and what you can do like it was amazing so well done diana green awesome i'd love to uh we should have her on the show to talk about such things that would yeah. be a good idea yeah and then we um can. from there we i did three three events uh three charity events for big dog ranch rescue this weekend uh friday saturday and sunday cool. just got Very back good. uh literally 15 minutes ago from the usbg miami and USBG Palm Beach Broward and uh, uh, co monthly meeting. It was a good time with Sincoro Tequila. We we're playing some basketball. I did not make the finals, unfortunately. My points were 51. And uh, Isaac uh, Grillo, I don't know if you guys remember him from the, the Florida Canyon finals on our videos from earlier, took first right. place with 77 points. So uh, in a minute. Wow. So good for him. There you go. And a great bartender, too. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, um, coming up. Yeah, I think we have to tell everybody as soon as we can, we are going to take a mid-season break uh, of Cocktail Network Live, uh, one drink with, because, well, Rob, you've got a, a super busy schedule, and you know what? I'm going to travel to Italy. I've got a tour of Italy. Uh, I, I say that all, all fun and like, but uh, I have a huge opportunity. Marco Canova, famous flair bartender, and Matteo, uh, other flair bartender, uh, both work for uh, ABM now, and they have me coming over to Italy to do a five-city tour of Italy with Finest Call and Real, and I'm super excited about it. But uh, so we thought we'd just take a quick break, let uh, let Joe kind of catch up to some of our creative ideas and come back in May with a uh, with a kind of a bit of a new look uh, and sharpen things up. So looking forward to that. Yes, sir. Do we want to tease the guests? I want to go to Italy. Say that to the end of the show. <laughs> That's right, Joe. You, you can come, Joe. You just got to buy a ticket. You're more than welcome. Yeah. Can we show that tag? Can we show that to me today? This made this thing real. Uh, Joe's got a second to throw it up there. We'll see. What have you got coming up in the uh, next couple of weeks there, my friend? Oh, my God. Uh, we just launched a new cocktail menu at uh, one of the venues that I'm consulting at. So we're training the staff, getting ready for that. I'll be in New Orleans this okay. weekend. 
uh, doing an event, and I'm actually taking two days earlier to uh, spend a little me time there and see some of my New Orleans oh, friends there. Yeah, so if you're in the Baton Rouge right. area, you know who I'm talking to. We'll be doing uh, <laughs> lots of friendly uh, uh, lunchbox shots, which they're called, and we'll get to that some other time, Dean, but uh, yeah, enjoy right. life. I love the smell of Bourbon Street in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, I think we're caught up. I'm getting kind of thirsty here, man. I've been standing here talking to you and stuff. Are you getting thirsty? I am, but you, you know what? You want to talk about what just happened today and maybe the theme for our cocktails for our one minute mixology? Right. Well, neither one of us have gone blind, so we took precautions. Uh, we gazed into the sun safely today. Uh, I was at 99.7% in my region in Indiana, right above uh, ABM. So we got to see the entire thing. It was pretty cool. Pretty neat, uh, pretty neat to oh. see. Um, yeah, how about you? I'm a little jealous. We had the meeting. We were inside this beautiful speakeasy in this extreme action park with go-karts and video games and pop a right. shot and laser tag and ice skating. So when I walked out, it was a little too late. I looked up. Actually, I looked at my phone and went this way, like kind of like Medusa and Pegasus and Hercules. Okay, right, uh, right. Christmas. And I'm like, yep, that just looks like the sun, so I totally missed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it missed you. The, the solar eclipse missed seeing Rob. So. Oh, but that is <laughs> the theme of today's One Minute Mixology is the sure solar is. eclipse. So every week we challenge each other to come up with a creative original cocktail with some entertainment while we make it, all making it within one minute. And, th and at the end of that one minute, whatever we're left with, we are uh, have to drink uh, reluctantly or willingly to the end of the show. <laughs> the years are good enough. So I don't think we have it. We have a minute to the end without I might this time. I added up all my ingredients to nine ingredients today. I think I'm, I'm assuming I'm up. going first, so we're just going to go with that, and that's, uh, we're going to react to you a bit. You're on top. Okay. Joe, you want to count me down there, Dean? All right, so we're going to count you down here, Rob. Here we go. Three, two, one, go! One Minute Mixology, where we make cocktails all with fun, all with flair, and... We get others to stop and stare. So we're going to use one and a half ounce of mezcal. Use whatever favorite mezcal you want. I'm actually using 400 rabbits with that finest call stall, blood orange sour, which I'm sure Dean Sunil is going to tell us more about with it when we come back from the break. And then I'm going to use a half ounce of elderflower liqueur and a half ounce of cinnamon syrup. And then just because Dean's used it almost every episode so far, I'm using cranberry bitters. Two dashes of that. I had to throw it in here. Shake that up. And when we shake, we smile. And then we're going to strain that goodness into a black spear. That black spear is just a spear ice ball. But with the water, we added two drops of blue dye, yellow dye, and red dye for the dark side of the Dark side of the moon. Oh, great pose, man. You look great. Right. And it looks like the, uh, well, from the top view, like the eclipse where the sun went in front of the moon. It looks like there's a lime floating in it. Yeah. So in the water last night, it was black. And when I woke right. up this morning, it was black. And when I came home tonight, it's green. So <laughs> I got to work on a little bit more, I guess. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I can't wait to see your lips turn blue while you drink that when it starts to melt. Yeah, <laughs> damn on. good. <laughs> so my recipe, I was traveling with uh, Danielle on the East Coast, one of our salespeople, and we came up with this recipe while we were driving, and I made a cool drink picture and poster all with Chat GPT while we were driving. Uh, so it, it turned out kind of cool. I don't have the poster to show you today, but this is the solar flare. And three, two, three. Oh. <laughs> oh, I wasn't even paying attention. All right, here we go. What I wanted to do in the solar flare was make it kind of like a little bit of the uh, uh, tex or te tequila sunrise, but I didn't want just grenadine. So I've mixed grenadine and Aperol together in the bottom of this glass to give it a little bit more depth. And then we come on in here. I'm going to run out of time on this one. You watch. 
one and a half ounces of spicy jalapeno tequila, a little bit of cinnamon whisk, and here we go. Finest call citrus sour. This is lemon juice, lime juice, and orange juice already mixed together, and we'll shake this. Of course, there's agave nectar in there as well, giving a perfect mouthfeel from the tip of the tongue all the way through, pouring over top. Oop, a little spill. All right, five seconds to add some cranberry bitters. Just... <laughs> I saw the bottle sitting there. I'm like, yes! <laughs> I had to do it. I had to do it. So well done, buddy. You made it under the buzzer. Yeah. Inspired by the tequila sunrise, but uh, but not the tequila sunrise. So there it is. To... Cheers to you, sir. Cheers. You want to tell us why we're here? A little bit about this uh, finest called blood orange sour. Sure, sure. Yeah, other side. Yeah, we'll we'll never get it right. Um, yeah, the lemon sour and citrus, lemon sour, lime sour, citrus sour, blood orange, and grapefruit sour are all part of a family. I, I'll try not to go too long here. Um, they're all made with single pressed lemon juice and lime juice. So one pressing of lemon and lime juice, the real juice goes in here mixed with cane sugar and, uh, a little agave nectar as well for the mouthfeel to come to the tip of the tongue. All right. So lemon is just lemon. Lime is just lime again, real lime juice. Uh, and then citrus sour is lemon, lime, and a little bit of orange. And the blood orange is lemon juice, not from concentrate. Lime juice, not from concentrate. And blood orange juice, not from concentrate, from Sicily. So that's what's uh, that's been in all of these. So that's why we're so proud of these products because they are uh, real juices, all not from concentrate, uh, mixed with cane sugar. So when I said I had nine ingredients in my cocktail, it's because there's four in here. <laughs> <laughs> well done, my yeah. friend. Thank you for the update. Uh, hey, where'd you get that tequila? Yeah, Allison's gonna be upset because I stole it from upstairs. <laughs> this uh, this Tenteo tequila is uh, is Allison's absolutely favorite tequila. She loves the jalapeno and the spice that's coming. Uh, yeah, and there's a, there's a new fine. It's called uh, jalapeno as well, but we'll save that for another day. Nice. So uh, you have a drink. I have a drink. The show is called One Drink with Dean. Who are we drinking with today? Well, it's funny you should ask. All right. We have uh, our guest today coming in from Hungary. He's calling in from Hungary. It's it's 2 o'clock in the morning, almost 3 o'clock in the morning in, in Hungary right now. So bless him for staying up and hanging out with us so early. Um, as I was chatting with him before the show, we actually met in 2004 at an IBA competition in uh, in Las Vegas. You know, we meet so many people along the way, and it's been well, 20 years since I've seen him. Uh, he is a Flair Judge. You'll know him as uh, the Flair Judge POV on Instagram. He'll tell us all about that. He has judged well over 150 bartending competition over 20 years. Um, IBA comps, 50 to 60 WFA comps, eight roadhouses. So this guy has seen and judged more Flair bartenders than. Uh, than most. Uh, I don't know if there's any other flair judge out there that has those numbers. I'm sure there's a few up there. Sure there's close. A, yeah, McLean's got to be close for sure. But let's get him on the show. Let's have a drink with him and let's talk about his new Instagram uh, handle and, and all the things that he's bringing to the world uh, of flair bartending and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Sabi Soka. Hey, hey, hey. hey guys, how are you? <laughs> good morning, good morning. <laughs> or good, good evening. For you. Yes. <laughs> the sun is just setting for us, so we appreciate you taking the time. Um, with of course, that being of course. Said, it being morning, uh, first question we always ask is, "What are you drinking?" Yeah. Well, you know, uh, at that time of the night, uh, usually mm -hmm. we go for the hard stuff. So I am <laughs> drinking a very nice glass of Zakafa Exo rum, which is one of my ah, favorites, ooh. and. And anytime when there is a, something to celebrate, I use this one to celebrate with. So uh -huh. it's for well, you. We guys. are honored. We are honored. I'm sorry I made a tequila sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> it's always great. Good. 
So Savi, catch our, catch our viewers up a little bit. Maybe um, I'll give you a, maybe a minute to tell us how you got into bartending and how you got started. It's one of my favorite questions. How how we as young uh, young men or, or young women, men and women, not today, but got into the uh, industry. Well, it was a good twenty years ago uh, during a trip in Italy. I saw a flare competition, and wow. I and I and I approached to the guys. And uh, and we started to chat, and um, I I liked this whole competition so much that after I decided that I wanted want to go to this school. So I went to Perugia and I studied the basic of flare bartending from a very prestigious co- school called Planet One. And one of the owners of Planet One was an American guy, Corey Campbell, who was a former TGI Fridays World Champion. So okay. he brought the original know-how of the USA style bartending. So I was uh, lucky enough to study that one. And then I came to Hung- came back to Hungary and I started to do courses, schools, and one thing led to another. And here Great. we are. So did you bartend uh, in that time as well then? Did I miss that? Be- be- before that, I was working for a spirit company. So I'm coming from the sponsor right. side. And then of right. course, when I, when I had my bartending degree, I started to work on events, on music festivals, on shows and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. So what first got you into judging flair bartending competitions? Uh, it was interesting because, uh, you know, after I had my first courses, I, I always liked to work with talents. So I gathered the talented guys from Hungary right. and girls because we also had girls and uh, we started to travel to the neighborhood countries first for smaller flag competitions and uh, as I was there I was asked that would you like to judge a comp and I said yeah why not okay. so that was the that was the beginning small competitions just to understand the whole thing and then I, I was again lucky because I have a very good relationship with Tom Dyer we worked a lot together he was here in budapest for example one time he was preparing for his roadhouse world final in our bartender school and when he got involved to wfa he asked me that sabi would you like to join us as a judge and that was the more serious level when i when i understood much better you know the foundation that how you use a laptop how do you make notes and how do you use clickers and everything so this is how i became a certified judge wow that's a it's quite a storied career I, you know we, we we see these judges but i, I never stop to think about how it becomes a kind of a equal to the flair bartending as the competitor there's these judges that just travels from uh, all the events to events and then and become a big part yeah. of the scene and i appreciate you doing that when there were the golden ages of flair bartending you know <laughs> the early 2000s we had like 15 16 competitions in europe so it was pfft, it was massive, you know. The, those guys like uh, Tomek, Marek, Tom, Marco Canova, actually, also, uh, they were like rock stars, you know, traveling from comp to comp, living the life. All right. <laughs> and then I guess you weren't making a ton of money while these guys are making uh, tons of money, right? Yeah, exactly. They made tons of money. We made tons of experiences. <laughs> right. I have, a, I have a question with with the FBA. <clears throat> oh, yeah, there we go. With the yeah. FBA setting the precedence, and then the WFA continue with that with certified judging, and that was back in the mid two thousands. How has that affected judging nowadays? And what have we learned from it, or have we learned from it? Yeah, you know, uh, it was a very good initiative, initiative actually from WFA that they started these Grand Slam competitions and they, one of the requirements were was that you had to use at least two certified judges just to make sure that you have the right people in the judging panel. Uh, and uh, we had a very good uh, momentum with it and uh, organizers started to understand that if you, if you organize a comp, then, then you need good judges as well, just as you need a good stage, good lights, and of course, good competitors. The problem was the 2008 credit crunch, which affected the bartending industry uh, a lot. And uh, it, it also hit hard uh, the flare competition scene. And since then we had COVID and all the other stories happening right now in the world. So 
we lost that momentum. And uh, one of the areas where organizers started to save was inviting foreign country judges because they said that I can, you know, solve the problem with local judges. I know a guy or two. So those guys are much, much easy to reach and they don't cost that much money. And unfortunately, right now, here we are, that uh, judging is like a necessary bad thing sometimes for organizers, but... It's not good because a good judge is like a, an insurance, you know. Uh, nobody likes to pay for an insurance, but when you are in trouble, you are very happy that you have an insurance. So when oh, something that's, goes a, that's a really neat way of looking at it. I yeah, a, 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 good, a, a good judge is invisible. A good judge has to show off only if there is an issue to solve. That's at least my, my, my way of viewing these things. I agree. And if I felt like... I feel like judging is an important factor that gets overlooked at so many competitions. They put together these great rules and, and they look at the stage and this and that to bring the competitors. But I feel like the judging is always the last thing they look at or the or the the, the overall mm -hmm. introduction to the show, which Dean will point out very well sometimes. But I feel like if you pay your judges and you make, you turn it into a job, then you can ask and hold them to standards. If you just ask them to do this for me, hey, have a bar tabs, and then they start drinking while they're judging, I don't agree with that at all. Uh, I think right. like the, the hundreds of hours these guys put into practice for, for these competitions for the six minutes on stage, you have to treat them with respect. So with that being said, can judging, professional judging, certified judging, become a true profession in a job, or is it just something we just need to get the competition done with? Actually, you know, it, it, it has to be like that. If, it, if, it's, if we look to flair as a competitive sport, then it is the same that in every professional sport, if you have judges, those judges are professional judges who are trained for that, who are paid for that, because at the end of the day, they, they have to give their faces and they need to have to take the responsibility also. So if there is an issue to solve, then the judge has to be there and the judge has to suggest solutions for the organizers, for the competitors. If, if a competitor has a problem, that it is always the judge who he goes to and that the judge has to have an opinion and and he has to have a knowledge just to talk about the rules, talk about the reasons why the competitor got that score or that deduction. So it, it is a much more ser serious thing than just being there. And especially nowadays, judging is more of a celebrity kind of thing that we post great photos and uh, and if there is a problem, then we write on Instagram that it was the best competition ever. Anyway, so <laughs> that is something I don't like, to be honest. Right? Yeah, it, it, it's tough. It, you know, I, I don't think I've ever been part of a competition where there wasn't someone in the uh, list of competitors that was upset with a judge, needed to go talk to the judges uh, and, and find the time to talk to them. Um, what are your thoughts on on dealing with the, the the bartenders that are upset and 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 how can we do things differently to to better the communication between the bartender that may not like the judging or be happy with it uh, and the judge uh it is education you know I, and one of the reasons why i started this instagram account is not because i had too many too much free time and i didn't know what to do with it but i wanted to share information so what we have to understand that uh, in flair bartending, uh, the ego is a very important factor. We have guys with uh, great talent uh, who are on stage and all these activities come with a strong ego. And of course, if you don't win a competition, then your ego hurts. Right. And, uh, but you need to learn how to handle these emotions. And if, if you have a problem, because you can have a problem, it's of course, but you need to... Uh, you need to approach to the judges, to the organizers with respect. Respect for me is the most important. I know I always like to think that I, I always give the respect to everybody until that point when I don't get this back as, as a return. But I think that if we understand that it's a competition, right. then we need to we need to follow these rules and uh, just to talk to each other with respect and always focus on solutions, not on problems.
Right. You just uh, you step away. I mean, yeah, I've, I've been involved in some altercations between the judges and the competitors in the past. And it just, it never turns out well for people. And, and you know, we talk not inviting the, the competitor back for future competitions. Or, and, and, but we don't want to do that because we want everybody to be part of it, you know. Um, so it's always a challenge uh, when the emotion gets involved in it. And you know, these bartenders put in hundreds of hours prior to it uh, it makes sense that their emotion would get connected but um I, I wish we could find a way to to make that a little easier to to have that conversation you know uh but you talk know, you, about go ahead go ahead no 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 just just go ahead please okay all right all right uh <laughs> drops and deductions and that kind of stuff there's been some talk about um the level of, you know, how many points are, are on a deduction and because that changes the rules as, as well. And uh, we were talking earlier, there was, a, you brought up a conversation about having no deductions. Is that uh, is that right? Can you clarify that? Yeah, WFA is actually is doing this right now on the Grand Slam competitions that they just eliminated drops and spills. And to be honest, I see the reason behind because they say that uh, taking out deductions and spills from the competitions, you can take out a, a part of the pressure. And so guys can be more relaxed on stage. My problem is right. that I was watching many competitions and practice doesn't prove this. And uh, I'm a big fan of deductions because again, in other sports, in gymnastics, rhythmic gymnastics, figure skating, you always right. have deductions and uh, it is a much better uh, situation, I think, for the from from a competitor point of view. And I think we have to check this aspect as well, because it's important how competitors feel. And uh, for them, it's an important uh, number. It's an important feedback that I had zero drops. I had 20 drops. I had zero spills. I had 100 spills. It's a big difference, and especially because every organizer's main goal is just to put on the best shows, pure entertainment on stage. Right. But if you have many spills and drops, it's for a, a for an amateur crowd. It seems unprofessional because because people who don't have to do anything with flair, they don't understand these three tin two battle sequences. What they understand is the three battle juggling. The, the, right. the music interaction when you do taps and bumps to the beat and what they understand if you don't drop then you are good if you drop you are bad so <laughs> I, right. I i i think that deductions have an important part in flare competitions and uh, i'm i'm an advocate of that again right. i understand I, the I reason they do too. um <clears throat> Because that opens up a different conversation altogether. It's a completely different style of competition. If we don't uh, give them the, the a the numbers to measure themselves against each other on, like you were saying, but also if we don't hold them accountable to to making great drinks, they just become jugglers on stage, uh, and and it can be a great show. Don't get me wrong; it can be level of difficulty goes way up, and people start doing they start breaking uh, barriers. Uh, but it yeah, takes I, us away from bartending. It, it's not bartending anymore. So you kind of have to decide that going into the competition, whether you're going to be a bartending competition or a bottle flipping competition. Don't you think? I'm really happy that you brought this up. My last video was about just this very topic, that if you are a bartender in any circumstances, you have to make great drinks. And right. again, if we check flag competitions, the sponsors for flag competition is, uh, come from 99% from the spirit industry, from the liquor right. industry. You want to see and the bottles in the air. A, a, you want to see the bottle in the air, but at the end of the day, you need to have a product, a quality product. And unfortunately, in, back in the days, I had a few conversations with uh, brand, brand managers from spirit companies who said that it was like a good eight years ago, 10 years ago, when everybody was making a vodka cranberry on stage with water right and they say that yeah. guys it's a really nice thing but for my brand the value is zero and that was the time when the diageo came up with the world class bacardi had his own comp right. boss had right. the boss around the world and they said we, we focus on mixology because at the end of the day 
in Mixology, we have new exciting recipes, great presentations, you know, something they can work with. A brand manager, help, right? the, the, exception, the exception was the, 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 the guy, the Sky guy, who was supporting Legends back in the day. Because John, as right. far as John I know, he crashed. Yeah, yeah. John, he crashed. Bill be, be, because he's, he was crazy for flair. But yeah. usually it is not this case because you people, even today, sometimes don't know what is flair bartending because that's not their big job to know. Let me let me let me right. comment with two things. One one thing to, to before we move past it about the deductions, then I would love to comment on this. Yeah, I want to bring up another point too. And it's the hot one. <laughs> <laughs> with, with the deductions, I know I know we all feel different ways about this, and I love it. Um, I, I look at is is when I come to judging and especially organizing, and we touched on earlier is about competitors bitching and this and that. When it comes to positive points for the most part of judging a flair bartending competition it's interpretive it's how i feel it's it's my opinion from my experience right. of bartending and knowledge that i'm giving you this score and this is why i'm a judge and i'm in this seat but when it comes to deductions if we have spills if we have drops if we have missing ingredients tangible things that are black and white that we can all agree on well then it's black and white and these are why you're getting deducted so it makes it less of oh he won because of this is opinion or he lost because he didn't do this and I think deductions are important. And I've, I've heard the argument of, well, oh, you're getting dinged twice because you're losing it in smoothness. Bull crap. I've seen people do flare comps drop. Half the time, you don't even notice they drop because they're so smooth doing it. There's a difference right. when you do it right. Just learn how to do it. And when it comes it's to so cocktails, the second part, I think Dean and I can agree we're huge fans of this. I think that's why we lost a lot of money after the client and trying to get it back. And the sponsors wanted cocktails because I know Dean's going to go into it of what they can sell. And that's how we, we run these competitions now, at least for, for Bar Wars and the USBG, is we make a quality cocktail and we entertain it as well. Dean? Yeah, imagine how many cocktail books we can fill with these famous bartenders, these famous flair bartenders, and their great cocktails, uh, which we which we couldn't do a decade ago, right? You know, uh, and we could, we could create books with the sponsors and everything else. My other point on deductions is, Sabi, what if we go the other way with deductions and give you three drops? I call it the uh, the America's Got Talent deductions. <laughs> if there's a juggler on America's Got Talent and he drops three times, they're Xing him off stage, right? He's not good. He's gone. So what if our bartender's got three drops uh, or three spills and then they were just Xed off? What do you think that would do for the uh, the comp competitors? That is a very interesting concept, to be honest, and I think that it would be only suitable for invitation only competition where you invite those people who can that that kind of pressure on. So those people who right. can do a cocktail show without any rubber mats with uh, bottles and glassware. So we are right. talking about a handful of guys, I suppose. But I like this concept because uh, I also right. like uh, if flare competitions are not the same. So you use different set of rules uh, and you put the guys into different situations. It's also good for them because they can move out okay. a little bit of the comfort zone. What I just hate when somebody has one routine, one four minute and one six minute, and for one or two years, they just keep, bringing the same routine for every competition. <laughs> yeah. That's not good. Well, you know, if the, if, the, if, the, if there was only three drops allowed, then wouldn't that level the playing field a little bit more and make people only throw stuff that they know they can catch? And it would stop people from pushing the boundaries and pushing the level of difficulty up so they can still make a drink? Because that's what happens at work, right? In the bars. Right, and I think that then they can focus much more on the entertainment level, on showmanship, on music and interaction. And I think okay. these parts should be uh, pushed at least on the same level as they push difficulty. Because difficulty is, again, it's like, a, it's like when you are aging a good wine or a good rum. You right. need time to handle difficulty uh, with safe hands on stage. Uh, and if you cannot handle then it looks like a mess. And again, it's not good for the sponsors. It's not good for the audience. And and no matter how many times you talk about this one, I just watched the competition the other day online, and you could see that the beginner guys were focusing on difficulty. They wanted to go big. 
and it it was a disaster you know it was a disaster because there was no showmanship no music interaction sometimes they even got confused you know because they put uh, like three four shakers on the bar top okay so in this shaker i have which ingredient and again it looks like very unprofessional because if you don't if you cannot follow your recipe then how, how would you like to finish your drink so again this concept what you just mentioned i think it's a good one maybe it's worth trying Awesome. I'd love to see that. I really would. We are going to Dean would love to be a... the uh, Simon Cowell of it. <laughs> so let me yeah, ask you, you know, I tried that once and it didn't work. <laughs> so uh, one thing we're talking company. about is, is not so much telling everyone how to run their competition because I love the diversity of different yeah, competitions look for different things like this one's, sure. about chills, this one's about cocktails. This one's all about just, just, you know, balls to the wall flair. But what about at least coming to an agreement and standardizing the definition of categories, what showmanship is, what originality is, what difficulty is, and then pick and choose from what all those categories you want to put in your competition. Savvy, what are your thoughts on that? I think uh, it, it is a very good idea. And basically it, it happened because first the FBA and also then the WFA uh, made clear definitions uh, ne next to each category. So we have a definition right. for originality, for difficulty, for smooth, smoothness, execution, showmanship, music interaction, for everything. Uh, the problem is that sometimes, like there were a few years ago when IBA were using like way too many and uh, many categories which were overlapping. And sometimes you see that now, now there is a new trend on Grand Slam competitions that they use only three categories like a difficulty, originality, and choreography. And uh, again, as I hear from competitors, competitors need at least four, four or five categories just to understand the way how they are judged. So if we give them too much, it's not good because then, you know, we get lost in transition. But if we give them right. too, li too little, then they don't understand okay, so what has just happened? So I think we need to have right. four or five categories on most of the competitions. And one of them, these categories, I would support to be bartending skills. Because again, at the end of the day, we are bartenders. So, and if you cannot perform right. like a bartender, then like back in the days when everybody started his career in TGF Fridays, especially in the US, and then when right. they started to flip, flip bottles, then the manager came that okay, do you know the recipe of the June bag? No. Okay, pull down the <laughs> bottles and go learn your recipes. And right. make, you know, how to run a station and stuff like that. And when you have the basics, then you can start flipping. And this is what is missing right now, I think. Yeah. So let's let's take it a step further. Now that we have defined categories and we can pick and choose what we want and we, we agree cocktails should be important to get to keep the sponsors involved and keep those monies going so we can keep doing these competitions we agree that we should have certified professional judges we agree that the competitors should be professional regardless of the results but what about let's take it a step further holding our judges accountable for what they're putting down as their scores right so being transparent showing the results of the scores and we'll get to when we share the results i know dean has that question coming up soon but actually either showing the judge and what they scored or at least judge one, judge two, judge three and what they scored. So if I'm putting you in that chair, I, you're going to put this score down. You're not just going to put the score down and hide behind, you know, the clipboard like, ah, they don't know who I am. And I'm going to just score you how you want. Like, no, that score means something because it means something to them and all hard work they put in. What about holding our judges accountable and, and being transparent on those scores? What are your thoughts? And, and should we do this more? 100. 100 percent 100 percent you know uh, i i think that again this is a job so uh, the job what comes with advantages because you can travel to a competition and your trip is paid that's one thing but you also have the responsibilities so you have to be there before the competitors competitors you need you have to learn the rules by heart and uh, you have to make notes and you have to give uh, a feedback and uh, and uh, you have to you have to give an explanation for your scores. So if a competitor approaches to you after the competition, okay, Sabi, can you tell me how come that I got 45 for difficulty and the other guy got 47 for difficulty? Because, you know, again, these guys are watching each other and all, 
everybody has an opponent who they would like to uh, beat. And they always make these comparisons and, uh, and they come up with these questions. And usually if we give out only the averages, we can hide behind the averages and we can always point to the other judge that it was him, it was not me. But no, I, I, I'm 100% on the side that we have we have to give out all the scores. If a competitor asks me, I always send my scores. Of course, only my scores because I I, I don't want to send other judges' scores. It's their thing to agree with it or not. But I always share my scores with the uh, with the competitors because I think this is the way. Do you think it should be like <clears throat> when the competitor reaches out to you for your scores? Don't you think there should be just a place where they go to get all the scores so that the judge doesn't have to to communicate one on one, like over emails and future conversations and, you know, phone calls or whatever? Uh, maybe explain your scores to them just once, but not have to go back and forth with every single competitor for every competition. You know, uh, usually uh, I think the best is that after the uh, announcement, the award winning ceremony, we should give out the scores. Uh, it can be in a in a printed form, or we can make a screenshot of the different score sheets, and we can upload to the competitors' Facebook group or WhatsApp group, whatever group right. they have, so they can have uh, the scores instantly. I because they have the right to know this. The, the reason why they are traveling to competition is to compete. And once the results are announced, everybody would like to know, okay, what is my position? How do I, how did I finish the competition? So we can give out the scores like this uh, instantly. I always also support that a judge has a responsibility also after the competition. So again, sometimes right after the competition, you cannot have a conversation with a competitor who just lost it because right. that one, I, right. I had well, very good experiences. Running high, you can't I had, talk. Yeah, I had competitions when a guy was shouting at me for one hour. Oh, uh, it's not a good thing. Yeah, it was bad, but whatever. So the day after or two days later, if somebody approaches to a judge, I think the judge should give a feedback, you know, based on the notes that, listen, these were the high points of your routine and these were the low points of the routine so and i would suggest to you to change this and this and work on that i was i just was in a competition and then i got a question after the comp and i just made a whole one uh, one a4 page with my notes and everything because i think this is how you do it because right. this is how the competitors can evolve and learn right Savvy, tell me a little bit more about uh, your dot com or uh, sorry, your Instagram uh, and what you're trying to achieve with your Instagram uh, and, and some of your other future plans. And before you say that, I hope you'll join us in the Patreon uh, one more drink with uh, section after this show at about 930. Will you join us for that? Of course, of course, of course. Uh, this is the reason why I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I want to get into more conversation about showmanship versus level of difficulty. Uh, that's nice. been a, a big part of, uh, that's been the thorn in my side for my entire career. Uh, so I, I'd love to chat about that in the, uh, in one more drink with on Patreon with you. Um, okay. But tell us uh, more about uh, what your future plans are and, and where you're, where you're planning to take all of this great knowledge of yours. You know, the reason why I did this account, because uh, in the past years, I was experiencing a few things that I didn't really like in terms of judging and everything. Right. And uh, I had two choices, keep complaining or do something against it. So I thought, but let's use social media for education. I think that is the real uh, use of social media that you try to educate people. So this is why I created this account when I, when I tried First, I uh, try to show all the different uh, parts of the job, what we are doing, uh, being a professional judge, what does it mean? How do you prepare for a comp? What do you do during a comp? What do you do after a comp? And now I'm at that part when I try to give help for mainly beginner flag competitors of how you should prepare for a competition, how you should uh, focus on drink making, music, showmanship, 
then how to how to understand uh, for example the scoring sheet the scoring system how to use the scoring system for you for example Marco Canova was just excellent in this he was he was one of those competitors who always read the scoring system and you could always see that he was preparing his routine based on the actual scoring system and this is how you can win competitions that you are smart Right. So, so and all the rules you score in the categories exactly. Of course, of course, you tick all the boxes, you know. And uh, uh, I lucky, I'm lucky because I have a few invitations. Uh, like this Sunday, I will go to Poland for the Polish national uh, championship, where there are 28 bartenders, which is just great for an IBA qualification, yeah, a wonderful. national. And during the summer, I will go to Finland. There is a nice, very nice competition at Kalajoki which is happening every year. It has a great atmosphere, nice level, nice lineup. So I'm really happy that I'm there. And then we will see. I also would like to help with IBA because I think also there is room for improvement. We will see that. We need I'm lots of room for that. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So let's hope that also that one yeah, will come. Will and we will see. So are there more competitions coming back in general? Uh, do you see that coming back? Uh, they're, they're starting to grow, certainly after COVID, but after the decade of, of, of a downturn and flare, there's more competitions coming back in general? Yeah, I think now we have, uh, again, we gained some momentum. Uh, we have different kind of competitions because before 2008, we had like, even in Europe, we had competitions where the first price was... Uh, minimum 3,000 or 4,000 euros. Those right. days are gone. Now you can have a competition where the whole prize, f prize money fund is not more than 5,000 or 6,000 euros. And again, if you work with these kind of uh, budgets, then again, you see the issue why they don't invite judges from abroad because then it, they have much more serious costs to cover. So right. hopefully this will change and uh, slowly, slowly we can get back to that stage where we were before COVID, before the credit crunch. Right. Yeah, we have to, we have to slowly build it back up um, and, and having professionals like you in your position and being able to educate new new bartenders and new judges along the way uh, is, is really gives us a great chance of, of rebuilding it to, to what it had been in the early 2000s, which we all look forward to seeing again. So. Yes, it was the golden ages. It was like, an, and I'm really happy and grateful that I was part of it. You know, like all these good, like Roadhouse Grand Finals, Sky Global Competitions, uh, Paris Flair Open, uh, the, the invitation only competition in Monaco. So we had legendary competitions, legendary competitions. And you had legends. Right. And 2004, there was the Blue Blazer, which I liked a lot. That was an exceptional yeah, concept. Yeah, I was in the first one of those. Yeah, I took fourth place, I think, in the first Blue Blazer. Um, yeah, yeah actually, I was looking forward to watching it. Right, I was watching that <laughs> competition. To, uh, to chatting more in the uh, in the uh, Patreon, uh, also about how we organize these rules for the judges, or sorry, for the audience. Uh, I think when we have a level of difficulty that's too high, the audience just loses knowledge; they can't follow it. Uh, but the showmanship and music and all those other things are things that the audience can follow along and truly enjoy. Uh, and I think we miss out on that when we only focus on difficulty. But we'll talk about that in uh, the Patreon. He's in it out there right now. <laughs> Rob, exactly. go for it. Hey, trip me up, Rob, go. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure Joe's going to put the link in the Patreon of how to join us on the Patreon a little bit. But the Patreon is where we do one more drink with, where literally the tie comes off. Uh, we stop kind of drinking mixed cocktails and goes, go to straight booze. And just have those real conversations <laughs> like when you're after a bartending competition and the judges and competitors, all they're just talking, hanging out and having real conversations and giving real advice. And I, it's my favorite part of this show. And I look forward to where we're going to go down this rabbit hole with, with judging. And I think we're, the good thing is we all have different perspectives and we respect each other. It's going to be a, a great educational and, and fun conversation. Um, but before the Patreon, Dean, we do something called the final sip. Do you want to get into that? Uh, is there a uh, pour it forward? We're doing that after the final sip. We, I think let's do the final sip and then it. pour it forward. Since Joe just put up the final yeah, sip, and I forgot it. about it. I'm sorry. Right. I forgot about the pour it forward. Uh, my bad. Sabi, Sabi, here we talk about uh, the final sip. Uh, after the final sip, we have a, a question coming from our last week's guest. 
Uh, but on the final sip, all three of us will share uh, something from this conversation that we had that we really uh, that we really liked or enjoyed. Uh, and Rob's going first. <laughs> On the final I, sip. <laughs> so what literally the final sip there. Um, I think there's no one way to run a bartending competition. Um, I wish we can share with the audience that watches it, and more importantly, the competitors, the level of stress and work that puts on and goes into putting in a competition, which they don't see. And it's easy to, to sit there and see your side of an event and you put all these hundreds of hours in for the, like, again, the six minutes on stage, but you don't see all the hours that the, the organizers and the staff just busting their ass and getting no sleep doing as well and the judging. So if anything, I think I learned to take a step back and respect each other's positions when it comes to competitions from the audience to the staff members, to the competitors and the judges, and realize we're all here for the right reasons to put on a good time, have a good show and, and to continue to push the craft of bartending. Awesome. Awesome, Rob. Uh, my final sip uh, would be, uh, A, thank you very much for uh, putting a face on, on judging for bartending competitions, Savvy. Uh, so often uh, we don't get to meet the, the, the judges uh, face to face and, and certainly outside of their, their, their chair in front of the competition. Uh, but also approaching uh, the difficulty that bartenders have communicating with the judges after the show and being able to share that, that both parties need to be mature about it uh, and, and talk about the the results as a matter of fact thing. It's certainly not, hey, I'm doing this because I don't like you or whatever, uh, not making it personal like that. Uh, I've seen so much of that uh, in my career uh, and I just don't want to see people, you know, arguing and fighting over the rules of a bartending competition that are supposed to be fun. Uh, I get that everybody gets upset or, or can get emotionally wrapped up in it, but thank you for shedding light on that and, uh, and being able to just have an open conversation about that. Uh, and that's my final sip. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me because uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very important thing that we can talk about these things with uh, in details. And, uh, one of the reasons why I started to this account is it was actually that one, what you just said, Dean, that, that uh, I, I wanted to show the judging point of view to the competitors, that the judge is also human. It's not yeah. just a necessary bad thing in a competition who is there just to, you know, punish people and whatever. But it is also a profession what you can take seriously and you should take it seriously. And if you do it on the right level, uh, it can also be, and it should be, a, an important part of every competition. And and the keyword is for all flair competitions. What we sh should follow, I think, is respect. What Rob just said that without respect, it just doesn't work, like right. nothing in the world. So this is why Absolutely. I try to commu communicate and post just to gain more respect and more understanding in the flair scene. Right. All great points, guys, and I'm looking forward to chatting about those more in the Patreon. But first, let's pour it forward. Uh, this is our last week's guest uh, joining us uh, with a question for you, sir, as we pour it forward. Nice. And... <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting question. It will be hard to answer. Right, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Salbach, Tony Abuganum here. Uh, I hope we meet in person one day and share a cocktail. I love flair bartending. I've had the privilege of judging the taste, uh, the cocktail taste at the Bacardi Martini Grand Prix 2001, 2002, 2003. And I'm just curious. How important is the overall flavor and complexity of the cocktail when we're judging a flair performance? Thank you, and I look forward to that cocktail. The legend. 
the legend and it was a very good competition the bacardi martini grand prix finals were just great finals like a lot of good guys won competitions there especially from italy like bruno van zan marco cordiati right. great great fair bartenders and uh just to answer the question so the cocktail is always very important because that is the end product that is the purpose of the whole flare show another story is that usually uh, regarding the scores the cocktail is around 20 15 maximum yeah 15 20 percent of the whole technical scores so right. but at the end of the day <laughs> it it always comes down to the deductions and the cocktail scores so always right. those two things decide the winner from the second runner-up so it is important and especially in flare bartending competitions you can have the best recipe in the world if you cannot deliver it on stage if you mess up the ingredients if you cannot if you cannot perform perfect pours if you have lots of spills if you use wet ice if you don't shake properly no matter how good the recipe was the cocktail won't be good because you didn't perform well the bartending part so that's right it is very important right so should we have separate judges just uh just cocktail judges and just flare judges or should we definitely. hope to one day have judges that can do both no 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 definitely because uh, rule number one a technical judge cannot drink alcohol during <laughs> during judging so imagine right. if you have to test like uh like back in the days in poland and in ukraine there were competitions but also there will be one in portugal uh, uh in april with 62 in competitors imagine that if you're a technical judge and if you if you have to taste like 62 cocktails then you have no clue what is going on wow that's crazy yeah that wouldn't work very well at all it reminds me of the uh, the days back in quest in the late 90s where the judges were uh yeah the judges couldn't they couldn't finish the the competition because they were too intoxicated <laughs> that was back in the day way back in the day when we were just doing this for giggles before the uh, FDA got involved, Jesus, Dean, you're going way back in the day. Way back, way back. We were just doing this for fun back then. But that's the most uh, important thing. That almost all big competitions started as a fun, like also Rodas. It started as a fun project. Right. So. Right. And piracy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Sabi, uh, we're going to show your uh, your Instagram. We want everybody to follow the Instagram. We'll be part of that. Uh, if you could tell us um, where they can find it and then maybe do a, a, a little quick tidbit. I know I already asked you, but a little quick uh, tick. Describe what your Instagram is about a little bit. Well, this is the actually uh, the account name, the Flare Judge PO, POV, point of view. And uh, I share the uh, weekly content about uh, how to prepare for Flare competitions, how a Flare Judge works. Uh, on a competition and uh, if I travel to a competition I try to uh, uh, make some contact from the actual competition uh, sometimes I'm doing also memes you know just to fun stuff what I have in my mind and they have to do something with flair so that's it it won't be like a Kim Kardashian level of account that is not my purpose I just would like to reach those people who are involved, like organizers, competitors, other judges. That's it. Great. Rob? I, I, I think we just kind of like opened up the Band-Aid and there's so much to talk about. We, so, we much, just, so much. So much. I'm just scratching the surface. I just looked. I'm like, oh, my God, it's been an hour already. Uh, I, I just can't wait for one more drink with him to keep this conversation going. So, uh I, I just can't Let's wait to go down this rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, gosh, this could just go so deep, so deep. I mean, how many times have we had this conversation with a bottle of bourbon in a hotel room after a competition with a bunch of people, you know? Uh, so great to have you on and share it. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to hit uh, the Patreon. We'll be at one more drink with 30. So get over there and join us if you're watching. Uh, if not, if you're watching this uh uh, in rerun form of some sort, go catch, check out uh, Cocktail Network Live on Patreon so that you can see uh, the extra content that we're shooting here with Sabe Soka. All right, Sabe, we're going to let you go. Uh, we'll be back to you in a few minutes. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank Don't you. Go too far. Thank you, guys. <laughs>
No, no. <laughs> bye, bye. Wow, Dean. I, I, there, I just want to keep talking. There's, I, I can't believe like it went by like that. Yeah, I had so many other little notes that I wanted to t- talk about, and and then, and then I know you were jumping in. You're like, well, what about this? It just could have gone on and on, and I love it. So hopefully we'll get some really good uh, good content in the uh, one more drink with, but certainly have to have Savi back in the future to talk about some more of the events that he's doing because I think his uh, his his Instagram is really serving a fabulous pers- uh, purpose of educating uh, bartenders, uh, flair bartenders on what is truly being asked of them, uh, from the judge's point of view, because they just get a piece of paper or they read the rules. They, they don't know the mindset of the actual human that's judging them. So super important. And I appreciate all the work he's doing there. Or they just interpret Lee differently. And this is exactly like you said, the mindset. This is actually what we're looking for. This is not what you think we're looking for. Just because I put on the most difficulty and have a beautiful looking cocktail doesn't mean you're going to win because this competition wants this, 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 and this. Yeah, I agree. Right. Yeah. And you can't go into each competition with the exact same uh, show uh, or the exact same drinks, of course, because all the rules are different depending on the competition. Uh, it'd be great. I know we had one uh, one uh, comment come up on the screen. They're talking about uh, the IBA competitions. There's a standard there, but uh, you know, can we find a standard around the world? Who knows? Yeah, uh, but speaking Ooh, yeah. of competitions, again, our next competition coming up June 9th through the 11th, the Cocktail yeah. Art Challenge happening on National Flair Bartenders Day, June 10th. Uh, for more information, check out bartendbetternow.com. Registration goes live this Wednesday because everyone's been hitting me up. Oh, I want to register. So I want to register. register. And we're limited to the first 20 people that sign up, and you're in. So this Wednesday by midnight, bartendbetternow.com. That's pretty exciting stuff. I love the I love I love it when we get into competition season and everybody starts chatting and then asking questions and all that. I uh, just love it. So uh, thank you, Rob. Next week on the show, actually not next week, we are going to take a, uh, a short break for the uh, rest of April while I do my European tour and uh, Rob takes care of things here. Uh, and so May 6th, I think, was it May 6th? Uh, we will be back with Phil Wills of Bar Rescue, uh, our only guest to be on three seasons of One Drink With. Yes. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah, Rob and I had drinks with him in Vegas uh, last week, two weeks ago. Could be three I weeks mean, by now. I can't keep track. It, it was it was it was a good time. Fuel bar, you guys. Yeah, you guys are all through a party there. Absolutely. So Phil Wills will be on the show in on May 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 sixth. Look forward to having you guys back here. Be sure to check out the Patreon for any of the uh, shows that you've missed, and go back into our archives to uh, to follow up on on other shows that you've missed. Uh, lots of great things going on here on Cocktail Network Live. Thanks, Rob. And thanks, uh, Sabi Soka. <laughs>